Welcome to Her Remarkable History. Remember, to support our channel, please subscribe. The death of Princess Charlotte, the woman who should have been Queen. The 1800s housed the reign of Queen Victoria. She spanned across 63 years and seven months, and in her time she saw changes in areas such as industry, science and military. She also saw changes in politics and the British Empire expanded. She was even granted the title of the Empress of India in 1876. But Queen Victoria was the niece of King George IV, and it was only due to the premature death of his daughter, Princess Charlotte, that Victoria found her way to becoming Queen. Born in 1796, Princess Charlotte Augusta of Wales, it was the daughter of George, the Prince of Wales, later George IV, and Caroline of Brunswick. Charlotte was the sole legitimate heir to the British throne, and as such became the heir presumptive. At this point, it's interesting to note that her grandfather is recorded as saying that he always wished it should be of that sex. Charlotte's parents were not in a happy marriage, and unfortunately for the king, it spoiled his hopes of a male heir to his throne. Charlotte's father then, after their unofficial separation, took the sole guardianship of his daughter and said that his wife should not be allowed to make any decisions regarding the care of Princess Charlotte. Charlotte was cared for mostly by governesses and attendants, and her father sought advice on many occasions from his own mother. He wrote on one occasion that her choice and opinion will ever guide mine. Now Charlotte, until the age of around three, lived with her father, but was then moved to Shrewsbury House in 1799, and then in 1805, Lower Lodge in Windsor. It was in Windsor that Charlotte's education began, and it was of a high standard. It was strictly regimented, and was certainly befitting of a queen. Her lessons included history, French, English, Latin, and religious instruction, accompanied by dancing and music, with time allowed for other amusements and horse riding. Her education was not solely provided by governesses, but also by her preceptor or teacher, John Fisher, Bishop of Exeter, later the Bishop of Salisbury, and sub-preceptors. Now Charlotte wasn't naturally gifted and did struggle with spelling and handwriting, but she was extremely bright and showed a great interest in law and politics. Now Charlotte, however, was known to have a sharp temper and a manner in which was unusually informal. Her informal manner led to her having an inappropriate relationship with her sub-preceptor George Frederick Knott, who, when she was just 10 years of age, began to refer to her as his adopted daughter, and even made his way in being mentioned in her will. He was later accused of manipulating his charge. Now evidence of her temperament can also be found in Lady Elgin's memorandum concerning the confiscation of a watch, writing that the fire was kindled, the storm was violent, declaring her poor governess very cruel. Charlotte is noted as having many complex relationships with her family and some friends, but the most turbulent and complex would be the relationship between herself and her father. She often wrote to him to seek his approval and forgiveness. The prince's letters to his daughter demonstrate the infrequency in which he visited, yet this is not necessarily a sign of indifference, as he doted upon the young princess, and his apologies were frequently accompanied by tokens of his affection. Charlotte also longed for a relationship with her mother, who she often visited, but due to the rather noticeable and scandalous behaviour of her mother, the contact soon came to a halt due to the restrictions imposed. Now, despite the reputation Charlotte's mother obtained, she stayed loyal to her. That is, until her mother began to question her in relation to her romantic relations and motivations. Charlotte's love life was certainly eventful, even though it was short-lived. From 1811 to 1813, Charlotte had grown close with Captain Charles Hess. Charlotte and Hess passed illicit correspondence, and on his leave to the continent he retained these. This was a huge threat to Charlotte's reputation, as their relationship had come to an end. Now Charlotte, not surprisingly, became distressed by her predicament and enlisted the help of her close and trusted friend to try and retrieve the letters, Margaret Mercer Elphinstone, who wrote extensively to Hess between 1813 and 1814. 
Now, Hess was not particularly helpful, nor was he forthcoming. He refused to return the letters and said that they would be returned upon his death. He stated that some were kept in a chest with a friend who had instructions to send it unopened to the bottom of the Thames if he was killed in battle and the rest were on his person. In the December of 1814, Charlotte then confessed her relationship to her father and disclosed that she was left feeling confused as to whether Hess had been an admirer of her mother's. In addition to uh, Captain Hess, the princess was linked to several others, such as Prince William Frederick of Gloucester and an unknown man, thought to be Prince Augustus or Frederick of Prussia. However, as future queen, she was expected to marry high-ranking foreign royalty, and in 1813 her father deemed William, hereditary Prince of Orange, a suitable match. A meeting between the couple was arranged for the December of 1814, but far from being enamoured by the hereditary prince, the princess was pressured into accepting an engagement. Now, there were many high emotions surrounding the engagement and Charlotte was unhappy about prospects of leaving her country and she in protest ran to her mother's home. This stunt caused a pouring of public sympathy and Charlotte was then enabled to break off the engagement. Her father was dismayed by the termination of the agreement, but eventually he did accept his daughter's strong and fixed aversion to a match with a man whom I can never feel regard necessary in a matrimonial connection. On the 2nd of May 1816, Charlotte then married a man whom she had previously proposed to her father, Prince Leopold of saxe coburg The pair were thought to have been happy, and in the early 1817, Charlotte then became pregnant. On the 3rd of November the same year, Charlotte began her labour a struggle which lasted until the early hours of the 6th of November. The long and extremely difficult labour resulted in her son being born stillborn, and Charlotte, as a result of the complications, died just five short hours after the birth of her son. Her care was overseen by medical attendants Dr Matthew Bailey, Sir Richard Croft and Dr John Sims, and witnessed by privy councillors to authenticate the royal birth and it is their reports and correspondence which detail the confusion and uncertainty surrounding the labour. The public was shocked and upset by this tragedy, and they laid blame at Sir Richard Croft. This is because he made the decision to forgo the use of forceps, an instrument which was potentially lethal at the time. Although Charlotte's father, who at the time was the Prince Regent, said there was no blame to lay. Croft felt responsible and could not forgive himself. He, a few months later, took his own life, resulting in a triple obstetric tragedy. Charlotte's untimely death affected everyone she had been known to. Her family were in bits and her mother wrote to her father from the continent about how painful it is for me to take up my pen at this moment when I had flattered myself to make use of it by giving you joy which it has pleased the Almighty to turn to grief, a mourning for us all. Charlotte's father was so grief-stricken that he found himself unable to attend the funeral of his daughter on the 19th of November at St George's Chapel in Windsor. Within the chapel, she is interred with her son. The sudden loss of the popular princess impacted the entire nation, causing places of public entertainment to close out of respect, and on the day of her funeral, mourners lined the streets of Windsor. The monument marking her tomb in St George's Chapel, created by the sculptor Matthew Coates Wyatt, was funded by public subscription, and is a lasting testament to the popularity of the beloved princess who would have been queen. Thank you for watching and to support, please subscribe to Her Remarkable History. Thank you.